Joe, Glacier Bay National Park is probably in my top five of parks I'd like to visit that I haven't been to yet. It looks really cool. There's a lot of different ecosystems in the park. Um, it's a tough place to get to. Uh, I'll get into that a little bit here in the location Yeah, this, is, this would be a major prep yeah. for us to go to. This wouldn't be like, hey, let's go hiking in Glacier Bay. It's no, we need to do some research, some work, all, all the fun things. Yeah, so uh, Glacier uh, Bay National Park and Preserve lies west of Juneau, Alaska, and can only be reached by plane or boat. So you cannot drive there uh, from the lower 48 or even from Anchorage. Uh, the only road in the area that, uh, you know, it, it's just there to connect the small town of Gustavus and its airfield to the park headquarters at Bartlett Cove. Uh, the park was established December 2nd, 1980. They get about 597,000 visitors a year per 2018. And to put this in perspective, the population of Alaska, which we brought this up last time, but we didn't know the exact number, is actually 731,000 people. So uh, not a lot of people visit the park, but compared to how many live in Alaska, that that's a pretty big number. Um, like I said, there are no roads that lead to the park, um, and it's most easily reached by air travel. But uh, during summer months, there are ferries to uh, the small community of Gustavus that are, or directly to the uh, marina in Bartlett Cove. And uh, another frequent way people get to this park during the summer is through cruise ships. So um, I've always I always thought it'd be kind of fun to do like an Alaska cruise. Um, but the number of cruise ships they let in is regulated, so they probably don't want to wreck the local ecosystem with like hundreds of massive ships coming and going every day. Um, this area does have some very long human history to it, so the earliest traces of human occupation at Glacier Bay date back to about 10,000 years ago. Um, one of the issues, which I found this really interesting, because usually you don't hear about glacial activity in human time frames. But um, one of the reasons why they think human activity or evidence of human activity is so scarce now is because much of the area that was populated by kind of prehistoric humans uh, has been removed by glaciers. So um, it kind of basically scrubbed and scoured the ground of any evidence of uh, human activity in the region. So kind of cool. Sounds like uh, maybe the guy who's studying it like forgot to do his report, and he's like, ah, it was all taken away by glaciers. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> uh, so one of the first Europeans to explore was a French guy. Uh, he uh, explored uh, the Alaskan coast on foot in the region of Glacier Bay in 1786. Um, Russian fur traders are also, pro uh, also probably visited the region in the mid-18th century. The region was later visited by George Vancouver in Discovery, in 1794 during the Vancouver expedition. And one of our uh, favorite characters in history, John Muir visited Glacier Bay in uh, 1879, just prior to the 1880 establishment of Yosemite national park, which he went was, to every national park yeah. prior to them being national parks. That's yeah. how awesome he is. And uh, he, his, his life's work really was getting Yosemite established as a national park, but it was said that Glacier Bay was like his second favorite park. So pretty cool. Uh, Glacier Bay spans over 5,000 miles and it has some wild elevation changes from zero feet at the Pacific Ocean all the way up to 15,266 feet at Mount Fairweather, uh, one of the tallest mountains in the United States, by the way. Um, and it also marks the border between Alaska and Canada. Uh, another cool little factoid about the park, there's over 1,000 glaciers inside the park, which is pretty cool. And... Uh, archaeologists have confirmed that the lower section of Glacier Bay was habitable until about 300 years ago when a glacier forced all of the local inhabitants to flee the area. So, uh, so it was just growing and encroaching in on their living area? Yeah, so it, pretty interesting. You don't hear that a lot. Um, glacier Bay is actually one of the United Nations World Heritage Sites, which is kind of cool. Um, it's one of the largest parks internationally protected. Uh, sorry, it's... Uh, Glacier Bay National Park is part of uh, the largest internationally protected biosphere reserves in the world and is recognized by the United Nations. Kind of cool. Uh, like we said, John Muir is credited with discovering the park. Um, this is interesting. I, had, I didn't know these even existed, but uh, the park actually helps represent peace between nations. 
1932, Glacier Bay National Park uh, became part of the world's first international peace park meant to celebrate peaceful relations between the United States and Canada. Known as the Waterton Glacier International Peace Park, the international designation joined Glacier with Waterton Lakes National Park in Alberta, Canada. Because of this designation, the two parks are able to collaborate uh, in their policies for conservation, fire management, and research. That's cool. They kind of do the same thing with uh, uh, Montana. Glacier. Glacier National Park. I keep thinking it's not that because this is Glacier (laughs) Bay. (laughs) Yeah, right? (laughs) Um, Getting into a little bit of climate here, uh, our friends at the Köppen Climate Classification System uh, state that there are six climate zones within Glacier Bay National Park. So you've got uh, subarctic with cool summers and year-round rainfall, subpolar oceanic, temperate oceanic, humid continental mild summer wet all year, (laughs) humid continental dry cool summer, and warm summer Mediterranean. So a very wide range of weather you can experience in this park depending on elevation and when you go. Uh, Record high in the park is 82 degrees Fahrenheit in June. Now, we always say like temperatures and stuff, so I put some comparisons in here with Wisconsin just to kind of show that the weather and temperature in this park are actually pretty temperate and mild compared to like even where we live. So the record high in Wisconsin, it was 114 degrees Fahrenheit from 1936. Jeez. Uh, the record low in Glacier Bay is minus 11 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, in Wisconsin, it was minus 55 in 1996. I was going to say, the record low is only minus 11? Yeah. I so, feel like we just had that. Yeah, right? So that's like a f- January in Wisconsin. Well, yeah, negative 55 degrees in the 96. So yeah. I remember. I, like, remember that. It was cold. Well, we had negative, like, 40 and 50 with wind chill. Yeah couple of years like two or three years ago i just remember everyone's pipes were freezing yeah so obviously the hottest months uh in the park are may through august coldest months are october through march snowfalls range around 28 inches in january to uh they actually don't have any average snowfall from may to september so kind of interesting and they do experience 211 days of precipitation so kind of a rainy park we're uh, like totally prepared to go, yeah. Right. Weather wise, like yeah. it, we won't be shocked by the weather. No, I feel like the weather in Mount Rainier was worse. Yeah, it's going to be the ruggedness that we'll have to get used to, and the yeah. So uh, obviously, Glacier Bay National Park and Preserve occupies the northernmost section of the southeastern Alaska coastline between the Gulf of Alaska and Canada. So if you're not watching us on YouTube, it's kind of that little sliver that comes down south uh, of Alaska. If you're looking at the whole state. It's like the leg. Yeah. <laughs> that goes along British Columbia. Yeah. Um, so it, it's uh, it's pretty southern part of Alaska. Uh, some in, probably in Canada would say it should be part of Canada. <laughs> hey, we bought it fair and square. Yeah, right. For pennies on the dollar. Um, so some of there's a ton of mountains in this park. So some of the major peaks are Mount Fairweather at 15,325 feet. Which oh. actually has quite... Bad weather. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Terrible dad joke. Uh, yeah. Uh, oh, I get it now. <laughs> Took me a bit. It's been a long day. It's because you're smart. Uh, <laughs> you have to stoop down at very dumb levels to get my joke. <laughs> uh, we got Mount Carillion topping out at 12,726 feet. Mount Salisbury at 12,169 feet. And Mount Wilbur at 10,820 feet. In all, there are over 150 named mountain peaks in the park that are over 8,000 feet. It's actually where the first Salisbury steak was consumed by John Muir. <laughs> that is a lie. That is a... <laughs> that is uh, not a factual fact. Yeah. So <laughs> uh, the train, this is the cool part about this park, is the train is so varied uh, depending on where you are. So you've got rugged mountain ranges that kind of intermingle with the Pacific in a maze of ice uh, scoured fjords, valleys, beaches, straits, and islands. Um, so, and this is another cool part. The with anywhere in the park, uh, no point of land or sea is more than thirty miles from shore. So, that's a, a pretty cool little fact. Yeah, it almost looks like again for those watching the video, it looks like almost like it's very vascular, like blood vessels from far away, yeah. and it's just all waterways and inlets and things. It's really cool. It looks it looks really cool. Someday I'll get there. Yep. Um, animals in the park. So uh, we got over 300 species of plants that uh, 
you know, call this park its home. Um, they have five major land ecosystems in this park. So wet tundra, coastal forest, alpine tundra, glaciers, and meadows. Um, in the waters around the park, you've got humpback whales, orcas, stellar sea lions, uh, harbor seals, sea otters, porpoises. Uh, there's large brown and black bear populations. Now, this, Joe, is actually really cool, and I never heard of this before. Is the, it a bear fact? Yes. And, and we verified it? I verified okay. it. <laughs> the rare blue glacier bear lives in uh, Glacier Bay National Park. So it's a color phase black bear, sometimes referred to as the blue bear. It is a subspecies of the American black bear with a silver blue or gray hair. Uh Oh, cool. Like almost like when you see an oil slick and it gets yeah. like a little colorful. Yeah. I Is that what up, the hair does? Yeah. I search for them and they're, they, yeah, they look kind of, uh, kind of blue and they're big. So if they're standing on their hind legs, they're over 11 it's, feet. It's tall. called a, what a blue. It's called, um, a rare blue glacier bear. So for those listening, Joe is, uh, pulling up yeah, a picture. I'm, I'm looking up images. Yeah. Right they're, now. They're that top All corner right, one. On. I'm going to make sure this is live over here. Okay. Oh, wow. Yeah. So they're, they're really cool looking. And the next picture, they actually kind of like look blue. Um, so they're very unique and rare to this area, and I just found that kind of fascinating. Um, so if you go that to is a cool looking bear, yeah, if you go to Glacier, you might see a blue bear, which is kind of cool. Uh, the park also has lots of moose, wolves, um, Sitka black-tailed deer, mountain goats, and uh, bald eagles. So before I wrap up the um, location, I'm going to go into some of the risks that you might encounter in this park because it is a very remote park and there's only one area of the park that's kind of uh, built up. It's, I believe it's in that cove we mentioned earlier. So obviously hypothermia is a major risk if you're hiking in this park. Um, Especially with all that precipitation, if it's rainy a lot, yeah, you, you could get have, your clothes <clears throat> wet. Yeah, you could have long periods of rainy, overcast, cool weather which is very normal for this part of Alaska and summer daytime temperatures are usually in the range of 45 to 65 degrees Fahrenheit and nights stay cool to near freezing. So it's recommended, and this is right from the park service that you, you know, bring hat gloves uh, and rain gear and waterproof foot gear. So that's probably if you're just hiking, let alone camping for a long period of time. Yeah, absolutely. So another, this is an interesting one. I've never heard of this before. It's called paralytic shellfish poisoning. So eating mussels and clams in Glacier Bay is not recommended as there's a neurotoxin that calls, that causes paralytic uh, shellfish poisoning, um, and they're in high concentrations in the area. This is a naturally occurring toxin that affects humans as well as other animals and can lead to sudden death. Ooh, I wonder if it like starts, shuts down like central nervous system and stuff. Like yeah, like paralyzes, paralyzes so you like can't breathe. Yeah. Yeah, so don't eat any of the mussels or clams if you're hiking. All right, I don't like them, so that's perfect. <laughs> uh, obviously, bears are... Uh, a Issue in this park, Glacier Bay is home to both black bears, brown slash grizzly bears. <laughs> uh, and, and that's where they're big. Yeah. And when you, you get up in cold climate, they get bigger yeah. to live better and uh, they're scary up there. Yeah. You know, and you know, we always tell you kind of what to do when hiking in bear country, but you know, to lessen your chances of encountering a bear, you know, uh, you know, make noise while you're hiking. You always want to travel in groups. Avoid traveling at night. Uh, food, garbage, anything that has a scent to it must be stored properly, either in a, you know, strung up in a tree or. Throw shellfish at them? Yeah, throw shellfish at them. Uh, <laughs> Temporarily you know, paralyze them? I've, I've hiked with those bear resistant bear kegs, and um, sometimes campgrounds will have metal containers that you can store your food in. So um, be careful with that. Uh, Giardia. Yeah, they can still smell through it. It's yeah. supposed to just keep them from getting it. So they yeah. still get attracted to you. That's the irony of it. I think sometimes people think that it like blocks the scent. It's like, yeah. no, 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 no. They can smell it. It's just they'll be trying to get in for a long time. They Your best be bet to. is to put it in a bear keg and hang that like, I don't know, 50, 100 feet downwind from wherever you're sleeping. Yeah. Between trees, not against a tree. Because from <clears throat> what I remember, you know, from what I've been told by rangers is you want to get the food higher than the bear's like smell zone. So even on a bear, even on his hind legs, I think like those blue bears can get up to 11 feet. So you really got to be hanging that food higher than 11 oh, yeah. feet so that they can't smell it. Um, Giardia is a concern in this park. So people come to places like Alaska and see the crystal blue water and think it's really clean and uh, they drink it. And then they're on the toilet for the next two weeks. Yeah. 
So even though water may look clean, you do not want to drink it without either boiling it or filtering it or chemically treating it. Whenever I hike, I usually, obviously we have fire, but I always bring a filter and chemical yeah, uh, treatment. There could from, be dead animals upstream, fecal matter from animals upstream, things yep. like that. That's that's what's going to get you. Uh, tides are a big concern in this park, especially a lot of the hiking happens on the beaches. So Glacier Bay does experience dramatic tide changes up to 25 feet in six hours. So that's wild. So, yeah, I mean, I've in uh, Washington, we camped on the beach in Olympic National Park. So if you're camping on the beach in Glacier, you just got to be mindful that the tides can, you know, go up 25 feet. So you want to make sure you're not. Don't be against the water. Yeah, you're not w- waking up in the middle Certain of the night to, to the ocean slapping on you on your back. So um, obviously moose are an incredible problem in Alaska in general. Anyone who's been there, I remember seeing them walking down streets in Anchorage. I wouldn't say they're a problem. Yeah. They can be a problem can for a problem. you. Yes. Because that's their house. That's their house. <laughs> uh, anyone who's been to Alaska knows that moose are more common than people in Alaska. And, and they're mean. They can be mean and for no they're reason. Huge. And they are huge. They're absolutely massive. If you've never seen a moose in person, you'll be more scared of them than bears. <laughs> Did you ever see that video of the moose walking on the freeway that's like 10 feet tall? <laughs> no. Oh. You keep um, talking. I'll look it up and see if I can find it for the video. So uh, other than uh, moose, there's a poisonous plant in the park called baneberry that you really got to be careful of. It's very toxic to humans. Uh, it's a member of the buttercup family and aptly named bane, which is a, a derision from the Anglo-Saxon word meaning murderous. Uh, all parts of the plant are toxic. Ingesting just one berry can cause numbness in the mouth and tongue. The poison in three berries is enough to kill a child, and six berries will Jeez. effectively shut down the respiratory system in an adult. It was spurred in the dark. Yeah. <laughs> but you merely adopted it. It's so, the bane berry? Bane berry. <laughs> so, you know, that's just good advice. Oh, 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 sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> My bad. Um, so that's just good advice whenever you're hiking out in the wilderness. If you are not sure, like if you're – you're thinking about eating something and you're not sure what it is, don't eat it um, because you could end up in Alaska eating something called a baneberry that could literally kill you with six berries. Um, so difficulty in general in this park, I'll kind of breeze through this pretty quickly and so Joe can get to the character profile, but um, there really aren't any maintained trails in this park's wilderness. The backcountry hiking pretty much sticks to beaches, glacial riverbeds, Alpine meadows due to the rugged terrain and thick alder thickets. So you can do, you can hike anywhere in the park you want from what I read, but yeah, they're designated camping spots, but outside of that, it's pretty rugged. Yeah. And there's a lot of good hikes around uh, Bartlett Cove and that is the only developed area within Glacier. So it's Glacier Bay. So it's a very uh, remote rustic park. Um, we, we mentioned that the tides change really fast. Summer, during the summer, the days last 18 hours long here. So uh, if you're, you're in the summer and you're doing any alpine hiking, make sure to bring plenty of water. And one thing people forget when they're hiking in the mountains is sunscreen. Especially when it's cold. They don't think they need it. Yeah. You'll get so burned up if you don't put sunscreen on your face. <laughs> yeah. I've done it before. That was in uh, Africa when we got up to the top of Kili. Uh, I got sunburned like instantly. Yeah, and any exposed skin was just sunburned because you're like above the atmosphere. There's no atmospheric protection. You just like everything looked yellow. I remember it was yeah. very, very different looking. Yeah. So, uh, one final note that if you are backcountry hiking or camping, um, or even boating in there, you do need a free permit between May first and September thirtieth. So just keep that in mind. Uh, so Joe, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, Mr. Kevin O'Keefe? Sure. Per, but first, I'm going to show this sweet video of this moose real quick. It's like okay. one second long. Look, look at how big this thing is. So I think, I think it's I on a two lane this. street. Look at that thing. They're massive. It's yeah. twice the size of an SUV. There's an SUV parked. Like people are backing up. This thing is massive. Yeah, that is so wild. Jeez. Yep. It's their house. We just live near it. Yeah. And sometimes go into it, and if they don't want us there, we're not going to be.